Welcome back, guys, to my narration for part two of my book, Farfoot. Chapter five, Into the Abyss. The drive back to the fire tower felt like the longest of Jack's life. During the trip, his mind was flooded with constant thoughts. What was that creature? And who was the crazy old man? Jack did his best to push the thoughts out of his mind, yet they persevered in the back of his head. Finally arriving at the forest entrance, the group of officers made their way in. Shocked to see that the body that hung from the fire tower was missing, the other officers looked to Jack. Jack immediately pulled out his radio. Hey Ray, did you send someone else up here? Nope, you're the only one, Ray answered. Could the creature have done this, Jack thought? Jack took a look at the side trail and noticed that the footprints were no longer visible. Hey Terry, what are the chances we get an easy case for once, Jack said to an officer. The team did their best to retrace the path from earlier. However, after close to two hours of searching, the group gave up. The clearing has to be out there somewhere, Jack thought. No matter how hard the officers looked, they could not find it. One of the officers looked at Jack and said, So how did you guys find out about the body anyway? Apparently, Ray received the tip a few hours back, Jack stated. Strange fellow goes by the name Axel. Whatever that means, anyways. Officially puzzled, Jack and his fellow officers made their way back to the tower. As they made their way back, one of the other officers chimed in. Should we stay here and keep looking? No use, responded Jack. Someone must have stolen the kid's body, and they're probably long gone by now. Jack's radio cracked alive unexpectedly. Hey Jack, got a report about weird noises coming from an old abandoned mine near your location. Would you mind checking it out? Jack picked up his radio. Sure thing, are you talking about the old Sydney mine? Yeah, that's the one Ray replied. Once upon a time, the Sydney mine had been one of Farpoint's biggest money makers. In the 1800s, the discovery of coal and iron in the town's hills brought people from all over the world. By 1975, the mine had long been abandoned. Its final coal reserve had run dry. With the passage of time taking its toll, Jack wasn't sure how safe the mine was. Located roughly a mile and a half from the fire watch tower, the walk was a fairly brief one. As soon as they reached the mine's entrance, Jack radioed Ray. Hey Ray, we're heading in. With that, the team made their way into the dark, abandoned mine. Jack and two of the other officers pulled out flashlights. Beams of light poured out from them and illuminated the landscape. The moisture on the mine's walls glistened, and a large cart track ran through the tunnel's center. Making their way further down the tunnel, Jack heard a loud crunch from beneath his feet, and he nearly fell over. He had stepped on a human skull, and to make things worse, there were hundreds of other bones surrounding it. Jeez, it's like a graveyard down there, one of the officers said loudly. Shh, you don't want to wake whatever it is down here. All five officers drew their sidearms and said a silent prayer. They continued into the mine. More and more bones lined the ground. The old wooden supports groaned with the weight of the tunnel on their shoulders. Objects of all sorts could be found, and an old lantern sat on a rough, beaten-up wooden chair. What appeared to be a lever-action rifle rested against the chair as well. Its barrel was badly corroded with rust, and the wood of its stock had been badly warped with age. The word Winchester could be barely made out on its side, certainly not in working t condition, Jack thought. As the group traveled further into the mine, they noticed what appeared to be a human. Closer inspection revealed that it was in fact a skeleton. The body was leaned up against a wall, and Jack guessed that whoever it was had been in some sort of struggle. A gray uniform clung loosely to its decaying body. It resembled something out of an old Civil War documentary Jack used to watch. Inspecting the corpse, he realized that the body had something clutched in its hands. It looked like an old journal. Jack cautiously pulled the journal out of the skeleton's hand. As he opened it, the book's spine let out a loud creak. The journal was well-worn and yellowed. One entry read, December 16th, 1890. Intrigued by what it might contain, Jack carefully placed the journal in his coat pocket. 
Now is not the time to start reading, he thought with a chill. The group found the rest of the tunnel to be collapsed. Jack noticed a fairly small hole off to the side. Just big enough for something to crawl through, Jack pointed out to the other officers. We obviously can't go any further, but this certainly looks like the creature's lair. He proceeded to examine the hole and determined that it was indeed too small to crawl through. The dark, oppressive atmosphere of the mine was beginning to take its toll on the other officers. Officer Park's flashlight could be seen bouncing all over the place as he struggled to overcome his rattled nerves. Meanwhile, Officer Santiago began to mutter to himself in order to stay sane. Jack could tell that the group desperately wanted to leave. With the group's progress hindered, the officers turned around and made for the mine's entrance. On the way back out, the mine remained just as foreboding. Because of this, the officers quickened their pace significantly. After some time, the light of the mine's entrance came into view, and at that exact moment, it was as if all the tension in there immediately evaporated. One thing was for sure, this was no ordinary case. Chapter 6 Memories Untold December 16th, 1890 The weather had been frigid as of late. This winter weather just won't end. It has been a cold winter with temperatures rarely exceeding zero degrees Fahrenheit. The last thing I want to do is go out and get more firewood. The fire is down to its very last embers, though. Last time I nearly got frostbite going out there, but if I don't get moving, I'll freeze either way. The winter of 1890 will be one to remember for a long time. I couldn't even tell you the last time I saw the sun. Icicles hang off just about every ledge in my cabin, and with each gust of wind, I feel as if my cabin will blow over. Spring just can't come soon enough, I suppose. December 17th, 1890. Today, I made my way out to the trail that runs along my wooden cabin. The fresh snow glimmered in the morning light. It was to be a brief trek out to the wood pile. However, in the middle of December, it felt like ages. I set a log onto my cutting stand and began chopping the wood laid out before me. As I went about my task, my mind was flooded with thoughts. What was for dinner? When should I head back into town? My little neck of the woods is far away from civilization, but I like it that way. The town of Farpoint is about a day's ride away, and sometimes I go weeks without seeing another person. Sure, life is lonely, but after my wife's passing, I knew I'd never love someone again. Besides, I was a lifelong believer, and I know she'll be waiting for me when my time comes. Minutes turned into hours, and I began to lose myself in the task at hand. Only when the bitter cold began to claw at my fingertips did I wake from my trance. I collected a pile of wood and made the trek back to the cabin. Promptly placing the wood in the dwindling fire, a wave of relief poured over me. I was safe, at least for now. With it soon approaching dusk, I began to prepare myself for bed. Tonight was going to be a cold one for sure. I read a book over candlelight for as long as I could keep the wick lit. Soon after, a wave of fatigue came over me and I promptly passed out. December 18th, 1890. Dreaming was certainly nothing new to me. However, this particular one shook me to the core. In it, I was out in the cold amongst the snow. I'd been following rabbit tracks in a desperate bid to find something to eat. The tracks grew fainter with every step. In a panic, I trudged through the snow even quicker, leaving huge impressions in my wake. The trail I had was dotted with red specks. How peculiar, I thought. But as I continued, I realized that it was a trail of blood I was following. Sometime later, I came across the body of a woman. She had just recently been murdered as her body was still warm. The heat radiated off the surrounding snow. I promptly looked around and when suddenly, a voice filled my head. Thomas! Thomas! Its deep bellow echoed throughout the trees. Eat, Thomas. Eat. A horrible hunger consumed my every thought. I became more animal than man, and I feasted like never before. I awoke in a panic, sweat pouring down my body. That was the most terrifying nightmare I'd ever had. Quickly glancing at every single corner of the cabin, I promptly blew a sigh of relief. Soon after, I added more firewood to the fire. It was then that the door suddenly blew open, as if a tornado had grabbed a hold of it. I can't explain what came over me, 
but I was drawn to something outside. Exiting the safety of the cabin with nothing more than the clothes on my back, the cold of winter clawed at my skin. However, that did little in the trance that had taken hold of me. I trudged through the snow for hours, drawn to something I couldn't even see. Frostbite began to take control of my fingers, and each step grew more and more difficult. The faint growl of my stomach grew ever louder. It wasn't long before hunger gripped my entire body. Seeing the faint tracks of a rabbit in the snow, I jumped at the thought of any kind of food. Following the tracks for nearly half an hour, red specks began to dot the snow beneath my feet. I was too focused to realize what was happening before my eyes. The specks turned into pools of blood, and soon I stumbled upon the freshly slain body of a young girl. My stomach continued to churn with a rage I had never felt before. A voice called out to me even louder, saying, Eat, Thomas, and your hunger. Another laughed, almost childlike. We finally found him. How we've searched for so long. Honestly, I expected more. I blacked out, and before I knew it, I awoke in a puddle of blood. The body was gone, and I felt as if I had eaten a four-course meal. Could that really have been me? December 19th, 1890. I am a fool for believing I could escape them. No matter how far I run, they always find me. The process has begun and I am already losing myself. Upon waking from my trance, I tried to retreat to my cabin, but those creatures pursued me through the forest. I ended up taking refuge in a nearby mine. It appears to be abandoned as the mines have left for the winter. I will soon take my own life as it's far better to die than become one of them. How fitting is it for me, a world walker, to die at the hands of a monster? I conquered worlds and found it in order. Yet here I lay, broken and defeated. These creatures have pursued me for nearly ten years. All the others have fallen, and only I remain. And on this cursed day, I let my guard slip. As I write my final words, I, Thomas Barker, have only one thing left to say. Beware of the Wendigo. Chapter 7. Fire Chief Jack set the ancient journal down on the table. A thick cloud of dust exploded from its faded, leathery pages. Could this Wendigo be the creature I'm dealing with, he thought to himself. Parker, though, that's a good name. Although a great discovery, the journal had left Jack with more questions than answers. This had frustrated him greatly. Jack was impatient at times, to say the least. His goal had now shifted to figuring out a weakness of the creature. And after several shifts lost at the library, he found his answer. A few different sources on the Wendigo stated that the best way to kill one was by using silver bolts. A few to the heart should be enough to stop a Wendigo in its tracks. If that didn't work, a silver machete would finish the job. So after several hours of running errands, Jack headed back in the direction of the police station. He knew he had to explain the whole situation to the chief. It wasn't going to be easy, however. A visibly flustered Chief Horowitz shouted angrily at Jack. So let me get this straight. You lost a body, ran into some demon in the woods, and found hundreds of human bones in some mine? Either this is a made-up fairy tale or a pure nightmare. I'm not sure which is worse. Hey, I'm just telling it like it happened, Jack said with a wry smile. Something weird has been going on around here. You and I both know it. The chief thought about his statement for a second and soon nodded in agreement. You're right, Jack. Let me know if you find any leads on who stole the victim's body. Just then Ray rushed into the room. Hey Jack, we got another body. This time it's a park ranger. At the war forest, I'm guessing? Jack questioned. Yup. Right in front of that mine you found yesterday. A group of hikers found the body underneath a tree. This one's half eaten though. Jack looked confused. What do you mean half eaten? His head and shoulders are all that's left. Whatever it was, it had quite the snack. Jack turned to the chief. Go right ahead, Jack. Just don't lose the body this time. Soon after, Jack rushed out of the station, a flood of possibilities flooding his mind. This time he brought a rifle for good measure, 308 caliber to be exact. Edward Forest was a vast, sprawling labyrinth of trees surrounding the town on all sides. While he had become quite acquainted with the east side that held the fire watchtower, 
the west side was totally new territory. Unfortunately, it began to pour on the trip. With no boots or raincoat, it was going to be a long day. The location of the park ranger's body didn't surprise Jack at all. This forest must be the creature's hunting grounds, he thought. As he neared what he believed the mine to be, Jack saw a giant tree that stood out from the rest. Being devoid of leaves and bark, it looked straight out of an old horror movie. Certain enough, a body lay at its base, or what was left of it. Immediately, however, Jack caught movement in the corner of his eye. He promptly spun around with cat-like reflexes. A tall Native American man was approaching him. Jack figured that he must have been from the reservation that bordered this side of the forest. The man had a serious look on his face as he approached Jack. One of your people has summoned the spirit of the Wendigo, and it seeks you, Jack. What does it want from me, Jack questioned firmly. When someone consumes the flesh of a human, it changes a man. Their body is transformed into something else. Whoever consumes the flesh becomes the Wendigo, cursed to stalk these woods for eternity. A sudden feeling of deja vu flooded Jack's mind. He thought back to the scene of his wife's murder. She had been killed in a similar manner. Was she killed by a Wendigo? A few months ago, Jack would have thought this whole thing was a joke. But after his experience in the woods, he wasn't leaving anything to chance. So is there a way to kill a Wendigo, Jack asked. Only through fire can one slay a Wendigo, responded the man. Even then, a new one is soon to follow. These woods have been cursed for generations. You still never told me what it wants with me, Jack chimed back. I sensed it the first time I saw you, Jack. You're a world walker. You may not know it yet, but you have a gift. The Wendigo will haunt you forever until he obtains that gift. Jack thanked the man for his advice and began to investigate the body. By the time he turned around, the man was already gone. The ranger's body had been torn in two. Deep claw marks punctured his chest. Jack could barely make out his name tag through the coating of mud and blood. It read Ryan M. Park Ranger. While he knew he was going to chalk it up to a bear attack, he knew that no bear is capable of this much carnage. Whatever this creature was, took pleasure in killing. Jack wasn't taking any chances this time. He promptly made a crime scene around the body before calling it in. Soon a full team of officers and paramedics arrived. They were all completely puzzled by the sight. You could only use the excuse of a bear attack so many times. One of the paramedics said that it looked like a scene from an old werewolf movie. A line that everyone chuckled at loudly. After talking with the people at the scene, Jack took his leave. I have to figure out how to stop this thing before it kills again, Jack pondered to himself. Hey, what's up guys? Hope you enjoyed part 2. I'll be working on part 3 soon, but until next time, I'll catch you guys later.